I always just think Australia is just such a cool country for diversity of, of animals because you do get these, I remember growing up in Sydney and we'd get these, I forgot what they're called, lizards, the, the really cool looking lizards in the backyard. At the same time, you've got the birds and the snakes and the insects. And then the platypus, I, I totally forgot that something like the platypus even existed. And they're a weird kind of animal though, aren't they? They're egg laying yeah. mammals. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I think, you know, when the first... Well, when the British came to Australia and sent the samples of these platypus back to England, nobody believed that it was real. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Wanda. I'm Holly Cook. I'm joined today by my colleague, Dr. Anthony Reid. This is a show brought to you by the GeoCo. Today, we're having a fascinating conversation, at least I think, about life. You know, how it came to be, how it's evolved over time, how us as living creatures live on this planet, where where life is going into the future. So, Anthony, pleasure to have you on today. Thank you, Holly. Anthony, we spend a lot of time in rocks. And the thing about rocks is that they don't have eyeballs to look back at you. They, they don't do much other than exist and they're beautiful and they're wonderful and they tell their own stories. But there's something remarkable about feeling connected to the natural world that's alive in like in our wildlife even do you have something in that space that you can connect into something alive oh yeah i mean i've been thinking about our travels through tasmania actually and in particular the western part of tasmania in an area called the tarkine and of course you know tasmania is an unbelievably rich natural environment um because in largely because of the high rainfall there, which enables lots of species to grow and trees and whatever. But I was just thinking, you know, in terms of connection, it's 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 an amazing thing to see a rare or even an endangered species in the wild. And my I had this great time with our family. You know, we we were down there on a camping trip, and there's this little river which goes into what this other larger river called the Pyman River. And there's a little river which is a tributary to the Pyman. And near where this campsite was, you could could take a half an hour or maybe an hour walk uh, into the forest, through the forest, and it's, and it's getting dark. It's late because you're looking for platypus. <laughs> a platypus, ah. right? So uh, platypus is one of those things where everybody's heard of a platypus and, yeah. of course, you know, they are this strange combination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're such cool animals. Aren't yeah. they amazing, yeah. right? And so, but they're not easy to see. They're pretty mm. rare, right? You don't, you don't see them. So anyway, we, we made it out to this place just before, well, just, I guess, in the late afternoon because they come out, they obviously sleep during the day, they come out in the late afternoon and they start kind of, you know, making their way through the water. And and they're an amazing thing because you first, you just see little ripple marks on the surface of the water and you think, oh, What's that? And of course, you're saying, kids, kids, look, look, look. <laughs> of course, they disappeared by that yeah, time, right? Yeah. But but it's this sort of thing. And then eventually, yeah, it did. It swam, it, it sort of swam, made its way closer to us. And it, I, it's not like, you know, I'd made eyeball to eyeball contact with this <laughs> platypus, but the idea of going, wow, look at this incredible creature, which is just such a unique little creature to see in, in, in the natural environment. And I've got one other one I want to share. Yeah, right? go for it. So the platypus, and I've got another one. So up in the Kimberley region, also with the, with our family. Just flexing to the Kimberleys. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> I can't help but tell these stories. Yeah. So there's this, this there's, a, there's a Mitchell River. Um, I'm, again, once again, I apologise. I don't. I can't remember the traditional name for it. But the Mitchell Mitchell Falls and this other one called Merton Falls. Fantastic, mm-hmm. beautiful falls. It's amazing rock art um, on the on the rocks there, and right near there, again walking along with the kids and probably one of them was walking in front of me or in front of us and and they pointed out and we all stopped instinctively because we know when you're walking quietly in mm-hmm. the forest you've got to be careful because mm-hmm. you can see things so we saw a monjon now i knew their face i knew this face would come because they're not a very common right <laughs> they're really rare little like like an absolute dwarf kangaroo they're about 30 <laughs> centimeters high and they're super cute, like a think of a quokka, but a kangaroo type That's quokka. That's cute. So cute and so rare, like really, really rare animal to see. And you, you read, when you go up to the Kimberley, you hear, oh, the Monjons, the Monjons, this, the Monjons, that. It's on the website, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. But actually, it's very difficult to see. And you have to be there at the right time. But again, it's one of those things where you're like, oh, you just you feel so privileged to be there and see and connect with. That this rare cool. and amazing species. So, Holly. <laughs> and you got two. You got two. Well, I just thought I'd share a yeah. couple of them. But, yeah, what about you? So I grew up camping and so I think the I tap into living things on, on a bit more of a day-to-day level. Like so when we're camping, you're laying in your tent, it's, it's pitch black or if you're lucky it's a full moon so you're 
blaring right in, into you. But closing your eyes and listening to the sounds of birds was definitely a, a tap into that a, that living experience for me. And it's something I even do now, you know, when I was young, mum, mum's a bird lady. She's she's so cool. And she would say to us, if you're having trouble sleeping, just shut your eyes and listen to the outside world, mm. not the traffic, listen to the trickling water, listen to the birds out, outside. And even though it's been a bit too long since I've been outside, I'm really feeling I feel like I need to get out into nature a bit more lately. But what I am doing is when I walk our little French bulldog, our sausage dog of a sausage roll of a dog out into the park, <laughs> there's such such a cool variety of birds. And I'm just such a sucker for Australian animals. There's like the pink galahs, the kookaburras, mm. the sulfur crested cockatoos, the rosellas, the parrots. And then in amongst all of that, you've got a family of koalas at our local uh, park. And we have koalas walking in the front yard and in the park. So I I, I reckon that it is that sort of it's the sounds of the sounds, the sounds of living of nature. things, yeah, Absolutely. for sure, for sure. And then even the other wild bird experience when we were in Canada last year, Victoria Island off off the coast of British Columbia. What are those American eagles called? What are, so, the bald eagles? The bald eagles. We we were we were going through the Johnston Strait, and there was about it was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of and I'd never seen one right, and there were hundreds of them flying about. And it was something about the fish in the water that mm. got filled with gas, and they come to the top and natural yeah. like just normal bodily functions of the fish. Um, and they floated to the top and and they would be picked off by the eagles. And, again, it was the sound of these birds. And Big birds. So yeah. I reckon it's in the actually in, in the audio. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And how's the diversity? I mean, that's the thing. With all those, so you're talking about birds. I, I can think, think of plenty of great bird experiences that we've had as well. You know, but then we talked about marsupials and there's different types of marsupials. Mm. And then, and then, but on top of that, you've got all the other different mammals and and whatever, or the reptiles, so many different mm. reptiles, all of these different, you know, so many different creatures living in yeah. different ecosystems. The spiders, <laughs> the mosquitoes. <laughs> Too many mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah. Now that's one creature Snakes. we, could, yeah, we yeah. could do less of. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, heaps. And I always just think Australia is just such a cool country for diversity of of animals because you do get these I remember growing up in Sydney and we'd get these I forgot what they're called lizards the the really cool looking lizards in the backyard at the same time you've got the birds and the snakes and the insects and then the platypus I, I totally forgot that something like the platypus even existed and they're a weird kind of animal though aren't they they're egg laying yeah mammals yeah oh yeah yeah exactly exactly I think you know when the first well, when the British came to Australia and sent the samples of these platypus back to England Nobody believed that it was real. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> they were looking for stitching between the duck bill and the rest of the bird, uh, yeah. so the rest of the animal, saying oh, this this must be fake, right? Mm. But all of that, so all of that that diversity, in, and Australia is like this sort of you know is quite a unique continent in that way because of all these uh, these mammals and and the you know the unique sort of uh, uh, the unique types of mammals which are here, and the marsupial mammals, and that and that's different to some of the other continents which have the, the more of the placental mammals, right? And and so that and it's not a coincidence. <laughs> it's not a coincidence, and that it's in actually it, it stems way back in time to geography uh, and to geology. There's a big, there's a really big connection between the the kind of life in on various continents and islands mm. and how those continents of islands and islands have grown and shifted and changed through long, deep time, you know, deep time, so, cycles of supercontinent breakup and, and, mm. and, and dispersal. It's amazing stuff. So New Zealand is another example of that I've been thinking of, you know, where there are the um, nothophagus trees. You know, these are these these deciduous nothophagus, um, uh, which you can find in New Zealand. You actually find them in Tasmania as well. And in South America, this is this Gondwana, ancient Gondwana oh. fauna, right? Uh, to flora, right? Yeah. So this idea that supercontinents, uh, you know, back in the day, as in, you know, a couple of hundred million years ago. <laughs> the other week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A few hundred million years ago when Gondwana was a thing and it gradually rifted and broke apart and you can now find pieces of that, of that remnant flora scattered through southern continents. It's so, amazing stuff. So piecing together continents using, using leaves, using trees, using vegetation. It's you, a thing. Uh, it's a thing, yeah. That's Fossils. wild. Yeah. I am. Um, while we're blending geology and animals, I feel like I've read something about how when Krakatoa went off in the 1800s, like this is an immense volcanic mm, explosion huge. Um, and naturally destroyed life on the island. And so sort of there's records of how life eventually came back and, it, and there was an order to it. At first it was, you know, life came back in a manner that at, as the island sort of naturally recovered, 
certain life was suited to different stages of that recovery. Definitely. And it was entirely different life than what was on there before. And that that's a very strange thing is, you know, a, a, it migrated across life migrated across the ocean onto this sort of destroyed island and it didn't do, didn't look the same as it, it did before the, the volcanic same. <laughs> eruption it's also hard to imagine just how diverse these things are and and it, and for me a really important thing or concept to to talk about is is evolution right how 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 is it possible for such a diversity of species to exist why isn't it just a monoculture do you know what 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 are the key things that you know that 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 what you know when you think of evolution, what do you think of? Oh. <laughs> it's not an exam. I know. I know. I'm thinking what's the most honest answer I can give to that? And honestly, I think I, we were chatting earlier and I and I think, think about Charles Darwin. When I think evolution, it's hard to detach it from people. And so I think of Charles Darwin. And then whenever I read about how Charles Darwin was sort of discovering this idea, he was 22 years old on the HMAS Beagle. I'm 22. I want to feel like a failure? Read about what Charles no, Darwin was thinking about when he was 22 <laughs> years old. And um, it was it was what I think about with evolution is just how um how much the the landscape, the rocks, the natural world, um actually influenced how these how how great minds thought about yeah, about life. Definitely. But like I said, bio wasn't a strong suit. I, I like coming back to the landscape. Mm. Do you have more of a, a picture? Evolution. Yeah, because it's, it's slow, right? It's, it's slow. It's a slow. It's- well, there's different ideas, okay? Yeah. So it can happen quickly. Like, then the, the classic example of rapid evolution is Darwin's finches, which are on the Galapagos Islands. So Darwin went over to South America on his round the world journey in the Beagle and he went to the Galapagos Islands. Now, the Galapagos are a volcanic islands. I think they're only 10 million years old or something. They're yeah, quite and- relatively young geologically. And a population of finches made it to these islands from the South American mainland at some point in time. Okay. I don't, I don't remember the details of exactly when. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> at some point in time, yeah. these finches. So there, what the point is, there was an ancestral population of finches. Uh, and the islands themselves stick out, you know, some of them are taller, some of them are a lot more wind, some of them are dry, some are wet, you know, some are swampy, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of different ecosystems or, or kind of niches for creatures mm. To live in, right? And so these finches kind of went there and there was a huge amount of seed and whatever everywhere. So they, they, Whatever finches love. <laughs> whatever they eat, right? Yeah. Seed. And they spread out across the island and all these and, – and, and their successive descendants from those original populations started to change. So you didn't just have one population of uniform finches living on the Galapagos Islands because there's so much diversity in – the actual environment themselves. So the environment shapes the way they survive. Mm. And, and evolution is about survival. <laughs> survival of the fittest yep. is one of those concepts, right? So so uh, it, it, creatures or the, the finches which had uh, which were more well adapted to, you know, swampy land or swampy area, they thrive, right? Yeah. And their descendants, which, which, which I don't know if they're- if- Didn't like getting their feet swampy. <laughs> <laughs> didn't like sticky mud. Sticky mud. They didn't that, live. They died. Yeah. And, you know, so, so yeah. successful reproduction and survival leads to diversification. So in some area, they, you know, they, they had longer beaks they were, so they could eat different types of um, seeds. The other ones had shorter beaks or they had stronger beaks and this type of thing. So those sort of, and all of that links back to subtle genetic variation in every generation. Hmm. Every generation is subtly different internally, right? So there's everyone's a taller, smaller, wider, <laughs> you know, um, you know, all the different things, uh, different hair, whatever. And it's the same for all every generation of every type of organism. And it's that natural variation, which those subtle kind of variability impacted upon by the environmental conditions that leads to success, as in. Success meaning meaning the the, the successful uh, you know uh, you didn't die. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you were able to reproduce. Yeah. Life's gotten complicated these days. Uh, yeah, hasn't it? You're not saying. dead. You're a success. Did you reproduce? Yes yeah. or no? Right? <laughs> that's like in terms of evolutionary perspective. That's yeah. that's the kind the of hardcore biology. That the is biological the, yeah. perspective, right? Just my, passing down the genes. Yeah, my mind kind of goes. So that's sort of how evolution works. But life on this earth is an incredible, incredible story. I saw, a, a, I don't know, a, a fact and it stuck with me, which is that like something on the order of, you know, over half of life's story on, on, on planet Earth is pre-animal. 
It's like pre what would we, what, what we would actually call animal life. And I remember going to the Flinders and the Ediacara fauna and blah, blah, like beautiful animal, first animal fossils. And it, that was a profound experience for mm. me, seeing life in the record. But then you learn that that is really quite recent, like complex animal multicellular life is the recent stuff, for evidence for first life on the Just planet. Just such a geological statement. Those rocks are 600 million years old. <laughs> this is just such a typical geological. We just, yeah. we're just like, oh, 600, we're 10 yeah. million, 100 yeah. million, is nothing what, for us. What's in 600 million years when you've got life three and a half billion years ago? That's your point, right? Yeah. yeah that's your point. Exactly. So, so what, what, what are some of the oldest fossils then? I... So, or the oldest oldest life forms? I reckon the oldest fossil, oh, goodness, let's see if I get this right. The oldest sort of trace that we have of life is actually not really a fossil in the way you think about it. I think it's more a chemical signature. And so I, I read that in the southwestern coast of Greenland, oh, my God, what I'd do to get to Greenland, is are some sedimentary rocks. There's a mineral called apatite in there, and in that apatite is locked just a touch of carbon. Uh, and the way that carbon presents is in nature is there's different isotopes, so a different number of neutrons, and they exist in ratios. And the the key signal of life has been here is when it's a high carbon 13 ratio. There's a ratio change. There's right? a ratio exactly. change. Yep. And so they found this rock from Greenland, 3.9 billion years wow. old, and there is a signature in that carbon that can only come about if life has been there, so life we has process that carbon in some way exactly, yeah. and that's not that's not a, a shell fossil, that's not an imprint on a rock, that's just really zooming in into some carbon locked in an appetite, locked in a sedimentary rock, <laughs> probably on some rugged coast in Greenland. Well, you would be impressed by the actual fossil record of some of those ancient. Uh, the next sort of step, right, when you actually see once you actually see stratolites. something. <laughs> so, so the classic example is stromatolites. What right? stromatolites? So, yeah. <laughs> That's basically a stromatolite is like you have a, a mat of bacteria, right? Slightly algae bacteria. And then a little bit of sediment collects in that mat. And, and then a new mat of bacteria forms on top of that sediment, uh, on top of that. Yeah. And so on. So you get layer after layer of tiny little layers of, of bag, the, yeah. the detritus collected by algae yeah. and bacteria. <laughs> that was so underwhelming. Oh, my God. So the now- silt collected by bacteria <laughs> on a carpet mat. <laughs> so boring. I, we had also, the- can I just ask, yeah. the, the modern analogue for which this bacteria, we like to call it blue-green algae, and I'd like anyone listening to know that I have dressed up especially today in honour <laughs> of the blue-green algae, for which we understand schematolites. Um, anyway, I had to get it off my chest. Holly the blue-green. <laughs> Holly the blue-green blue algae. Blue-green Holly. Yeah, pretty much. So the, the uh, stromatolites are a, a, incredibly important. You talk about that chemical signature. So stromatolites are a much more visual signature, visual fossil of, of, these, of these algae and bacteria, ancient bacteria. But they are, they are exciting for geologists, but not so exciting for non-geologists, I found mm. out. So I went, so on that trip mm. I was talking about the Kimberley, we also went to the Pilbara and we got out the guide, geological guidebook and we had the GPS and we're following our way through some back country in the in the Pilbara <laughs> looking for these classic fossils right and they and and uh they I think they are 3.2 or 3.4 billion years old yes. like super old like 3400 million years it's like super old now I might have got that wrong but it's it's somewhere between let's just say 3 and 3.5 billion it's super old when it's okay crazy <laughs> old, for the for the for the nitpickers out there right yeah. but and I remember walking up this little hill and it's all spinifex covered, so of course you get getting bush bashed. <laughs> yeah, no. And I'm like, there it is, kids. It's just like, oh. And it, oh, you and- had kids. I would have been honest. <laughs> Dad, why are we here? <laughs> get humbled. <laughs> that was super humbling. Yeah. I was so excited. These are the oldest record of life, physical evidence for life on the planet. The and ones you actually went the, to. The ones we went to, the some of the oldest, if not the oldest, I think some they are. of the I think oldest, I've- yeah. Yeah, I think they are. Yeah, so I was just super excited. But, oh. of course, you know, yeah. so to understand these things, you have to think in deep time, you know, you have to be able to picture that progression. So from our, our blue-green algae holly, we, yeah. we've, we've come a long way, right? Yeah. So so have you got other fossil experiences? Have you got other things that you're thinking about when you think of fossils? Yeah, look, I was I was lucky enough to get to the recently opened, oh, I'm not sure what they call it. It's like the Nil, Nil, Nilpena. Nilpena in the Flinders Ranges, which is these beds of base of the first an- multicellular animal life that mm. cropped up on the planet. The sneaky little secret about the Ediacara f- fauna, and we'll call it about 570 million years mm. ago. Whether these, I don't know who, who's listening. That's a that's a very long time, but it's like we said, the Earth is four billion years old. It's kind of not. It's <laughs> um, relatively. <laughs> relatively, 
And these guys, it's generous to call them animals. They look like slimy yeah. mats yeah. and slimy leaves that just did this in the ocean. And then they sort of died and then they sort of disappeared. And we have what we called the Cambrian explosion, which is really where the, the first recognisable animals cropped up. And that was about, what, 500 million years yeah. ago? Whatever. Who Something cares? Like that. Yep. Um, so that's my fossil experience. And and like I said, I before I, I didn't quite appreciate how ridiculous it is to see the imprints of the only life that we know to exist in the universe. And I'm sort of awkwardly shuffling along. It's <laughs> I'm walking over it with my hiking boots. And, yeah, yeah. It, and, it, and it's crazy. And I, I often think back to when we talk about time, you know, the, the universe is what called 13 billion years old. And that feels really, really old until you start understanding you know, life on Earth has been around for three billion years of that. Um, and so, you know, the same elements that we have, that we had forged in the Big Bang, that, were, that are forged in the guts of stars when they when they explode, came together somehow on this Earth, first to create this oh, underwhelming blue-green Slime. algae mass, <laughs> but eventually it, it, it absolutely exploded into, you know, sentient creatures. Yeah. It's, it's ridiculous. It's incredible, yeah. And the impact that, that these blue-green algae had on the world as well, like the Earth, you know, back in the day when we're talking those three billion years ago, we couldn't have survived no. in the atmosphere. Was oxygen. That was Talk to me about oxygen, oxygen. back then. <laughs> well, yeah. that's kind of requisite for being human these days. <laughs> Needing oxygen. Yeah, that, yeah. I think we can agree on that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Some things some people can't agree on, but that one I think we should all be able to agree on. So, yeah, definitely back in, back in those days, um, you know, three billion years ago, there was much less oxygen. I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the numbers, but anyway, oh, who cares about numbers? a lot less oxygen, mm-hmm. un- unbreathable, right? Yeah. And it was through the activity of the blue-green algae photosynthesized. So two different types of way you can make your living. Like one is you actually use your environment in, to, in terms of chemistry mm-hmm. to create energy. And so you can get that energy from things like different, uh, uh, that's what I'm going to say is, Photosynthesis is what I'm trying to say. Cool. So you get the energy from light or you can get it from chemical reactions, right? Another way to make you living is by eating something else. <laughs> so there's these two basic ways of living, right? If you can just ingest something else and steal all their energy, yeah. then like right, so that awesome vitamin D. <laughs> awesome sunlight. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So you got you too. So that's that that little divergence there in in way of uh, in kind of generating energy is where you have plants and animals, mm. basically. Mm. Like, you know, it's obviously a bit more complicated than that. But anyway, the plants, what we, equivalent of plants who were photosynthesizing, the waste product of photosynthesis is oxygen. It, it's, it's, it's the waste product, right? Mm. Does this mean that the cyanobacteria, the blue-green algae, were actually killing themselves off by creating oxygen? Well, they, they, they actually, yeah, they did. In a sense, they reduced their habitable niche because yeah. everywhere else became full of oxygen. <laughs> so they had to migrate and retreat to areas which are really oxygen poor. Yeah which is where you find them today. Anyway, so there's this kind of progressive increase in oxygen in the, in the, in the atmosphere, so much so that by about 2.5 billion years, you, the oceans effectively rusted and all of the dissolved iron, which was in the ocean at the time, precipitated out. And that's how you get what these, these things, which we call iron formations, where all this steel that we drive around our cars and our fridges and all this stuff is made from steel, which was the rusting of the ocean about 2.5 billion years ago, mm. and the Pilbara is full of that. They're the iron formation of the Pilbara, right? That so is so biology fantastic. Biology and geology are super connected in that way. The, the formation of the, the Earth's um, oxygen is super connected to that. That's just fantastic. So the, the first breath, the first sort of big gasp of air that living creatures took on this planet changed, the, changed sort of the chemistry of the environment such that a bunch of iron fell out of the ocean a bunch of iron fell out of the ocean, deposited as rock, and we now we now use it to build our modern society two and a half billion years yeah, later. Yeah, yeah. Oh, blue green holly just got so much cooler. <laughs> <laughs> and I I something that I've got a little bone to pick, I think. And when as I was growing up, I loved the analogy of, you know, the earth is so old that if you if you got it down, if you broke it up into a 24 hour day or, you know, and sunrise was when I don't know, four billion years ago when the earth, four and a half billion years ago when the earth first came about, you know, humankind only came up in the last flash of like in the last flash before sunset. That's mm-hmm. how young we are. And that makes, that gives off the impression that there's nothing after sunset, that there's nothing after after nighttime. But human, that is just so not true. We are part of an active system where we're sort of the beneficiaries of 
three and a half billion years of evolution, but it doesn't stop with us. It's not like the future of, of the earth ends with humanity, right? We're, we're part of an ongoing, living, continuing earth system. System, absolutely. Yeah. We're part of that. We're the, we're the, we're the beneficiaries of all of that evolutionary success. <laughs> mm. And it's up to us to make the choices now that we make have impact on our descendants and what, what they're, and I'm not just talking like, you know, your grandchildren or something. You know, we must we must think in terms of hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of years. This is the time scale at which actually life operates on this earth. we it's very difficult for us to understand that <laughs> mere mortals, mm -hmm. but that's the reality of it. That's something that kind of keeps keeps me up at night as I sometimes feel like the conversations that we have among ourselves plan for a generation or two in advance, but the way that you know, forget the blue-green algae, forget the rise of fish, forget sort of the dinosaurs. Humankind is still pretty old on this. On like, I think modern humans is a couple hundred thousand years, but hominids go back millions of years. And we have to think a little bit further than just the generational outlook. I hope that humans are on this planet for a long time to come, but that's totally a matter of how we choose to engage with with our complex ecosystems, with the evolution that's happening right here and right now, because nature does reach, nature does operate in sort of an equilibrium, and humans are a force of disequilibrium. I would probably this say it's a very interesting perspective to take. <laughs>